Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back to Think Tech on a Monday morning. Goodness gracious. And we have a, uh, actually afternoon, we have a special show um, with uh, St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, and an, an immigration and other lawyer there who practices in St. Paul. His name is Wan Chang. Um, and we're going to talk today um, about immigration matters involving Chinese. Uh, if you didn't figure it out, Wang Chang is Chinese from China. So, Wang Chang, thank you for being on the show. It's so great to have you here, and I want to give a shout out to Russell Yu, who set this up. He has such interesting friends, and you are definitely one of them. Well, welcome to the show, Wang Chang. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Russell. And it's wonderful to be here. So tell me what, uh, what life is like in practicing in your practice. I take it you do three things. Um, you do artists, uh, you do foreign investment, and somehow they're all related, and you do mm -hmm. immigration. Tell, tell me how that practice works, and tell me how those three areas are related. Yeah, I work for a law firm called Kingsfield Law Office. And our office is what we call a law professor's law firm. And uh, all the leadership are law professors and uh, lawyers. So, uh, uh, for example, myself, I'm uh, 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 associate professor of law at uh, the largest law university in Beijing, China University of Political Science and Law. And I have a tiny position in Beijing, and I travel to Beijing two or three months uh, every year to teach American law and the constitutional law legal research in American law, entertainment law, and immigration law. And uh, so the other partners are also law professors. So uh, our, our form, we work for, number one, we work with many, many artists, both American artists and the Chinese artists. When they are doing uh, art exhibition, they want to sell their art, they want to uh, transport the artwork from China to the United States or from the United States to China, and we help them and we represent them. And number two, we do a lot of foreign investment related legal issues. So for example, we help US companies invest in Chinese company, help Chinese company invest in China, US company and uh, invest in and investigate. So first you need to do your due diligence and in order to make an informed decision of whether or not you want to partner with a particular law for a particular company, or you want to uh, acquire this company, and so we a lot of work related to due diligence. Then number three is immigration law, and we are specialized in uh, some areas, very specific areas. Number one is called alien with extraordinary ability, employment-based immigration uh, uh, category one. This is a, a reserve. That is so-called Einstein visa. It's reserved for alien with extremely outstanding achievements. So for example, uh, a scientist, professors, uh, senior researchers, uh, very famous artists, and uh, so probably you already know, for a foreigner to get a green card in the United States, it's very tedious and long process. But for a certain very, very small group of people, and that should not be pretty fast. This is called the Einstein visa. It's reserved for this small number of people. Mm. So we are very specialized and highly uh, skilled in this area. Mm. Why did you choose uh, St. Paul, of all the places in the country? You like the weather? That's a, yes, I do. I do. It's uh, just, uh, unbelievable. Here, here uh, we have a, a middle of August. And we have uh, uh, an upper 70 today, so not too bad. So uh, winter is terrible, of course. But let me tell you a long story short. I was born and grew up in Beijing, and I went to college and graduate school in Beijing. In the 18 years ago, in the year of 2000, almost exactly, oh my God, it's almost my 18th year's anniversary, two days short. August 22nd, I arrived in the United States, to start, it, to start my second graduate degree in art history in Illinois. So I completed my uh, graduate degree in Illinois, University of Illinois, 
the brandy champagne, in 2003, I transferred to University of Minnesota Law School. So I spent three years my legal education in the United States in Minnesota. And then after that, I just uh, passed the Minnesota bar and uh, uh, got a job offer with West Publishing, with a, the leading legal publisher in the United States. Now it's called Thompson Reuters. And uh, uh, until recently, I worked for Thompson Reuters as a chief researcher. But uh, uh, I'm transforming from a researcher and to a full-time practicing attorney. So my guess is you have an art collection. Uh, am I right about that? Yes. If, if so, what, what is your collection focused on? Is it focused on Chinese art, American art, European art? Uh, well, uh, two parts. It's, uh, one part is uh, Chinese antiques. So I, I, I'm sitting in my study, and uh, you can hear my immigrant, immigrant dogs barking outside. <laughs> and this is my study. I have all the Chinese furniture and some Ming Dynasty, some Qing Dynasty, and uh, a lot of thread-bound books. And uh, so this is old Chinese-style books, thread-bound books. And I have some uh, artworks from uh, uh, ancient times. Uh, and uh, and this, uh, uh, this is a large chunk of my collection, the antiques, uh, furniture and uh, sculpture and, and uh, little statues, uh, particularly in Buddhism. And the second part, because my wife and I work with a lot of artists, so, and uh, uh, as you probably imagine, a lot of artists, they do not like to pay very large legal fees. <laughs> so we, sometimes I, sometime I got paid by the artwork. And I appreciate that, you know. You know, if I I, I if I don't feel comfortable, I would say that this is you know too much, and uh, you know I prefer cash or something like that. But uh, that's joking. But I really appreciate that they they consider a lot of artists consider me as a friend, and they trust me, and they give me artwork. If you're going to take art in consideration of legal fees, you really need a, a degree in art history to know what you're getting. <laughs> And I suppose some artists yes. will come by and offer you their art, and you'll say, sorry, I know too much about art. I can't take your <laughs> <Yeah>. art. <laughs> well, it's a, well, it's a for, uh, you know, I, we, we can't only look at the market value, current market value. We, number one, we look at the potential, and then number two, and uh, uh, it, it's the, the artwork is the, the baby of the artist. They're babies. And they 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 they're willing to give you their babies, and that is you know valuable. That is just a tremendous you know privilege and and, and the trust. And I I just you know the other day I, I still remember one of the, my most cherished artwork is from an Italian uh, artist, and uh, he is also the 1997 Nobel Literature Prize laureate Dario Fo, and he gave me uh, one of his finest print. And so I really, really uh, cherish it. That is not in my Chinese study, that is in my study, uh, of course. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that is a privilege. I really appreciate that. Well, now that we've established that you're the Renaissance man of the 21st century, yeah, you're too kind. I want to get to oh the my God. You're too topic kind, of our show you're today, very kind. which is about immigration law. Uh, can you give us a little background on how yeah. many Chinese students are there in the United States right now? How many are studying in the U.S. from China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, currently this year, we just look at the number this year, there are 350,000 Chinese students on Chinese uh, on student visa and currently studying in the United States, either in high school or college, universities, and the graduate school, all professional schools law school and business school, medical school as well. So total number of Chinese students currently studying in the United States is around 350,000. What's the, what's the trend on this? What's the sea change? <clears throat> I mean, my, my own perception is that there are more Chinese students in high schools th these days than there were before. And in general, there yeah. are more Chinese Absolutely. students. Say again. Yes, absolutely. You you you're absolutely right. And the the trend, the the, the composition of the student the student body has been ever changing. 
to, to give you one example, you know, before I came to the United States in the year 2000, so that's 18 years ago. 18 years ago, vast majority, first of all, the, the, the number of Chinese students is increasing, has been ever increasing. This is a, a, a trend, very clear trend. Secondly, the, the, uh, the uh, composition of the students are uh, changing very dramatically. 18 years ago or until 15 years ago, uh, most of Chinese students studying in the United States were graduate students. So graduate students in graduate school. Why? Because first of all, you need to study English pretty hard. You need to pass a TOEFL examination and this is an English examination for foreign students. And you need to pass GRE examination, and that is a, uh, a graduate school entry exam. You need to pass both examinations in order to be admitted by a graduate school in the United States. And what, what is the benefit to be admitted in a graduate school in the United States? Because the graduate school can normally can provide financial assistance. We were poor students. I was a very poor student, and for three years study art history in uh, at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. I got a tuition waiver, full tuition waiver, so I didn't need to pay a penny for my tuition, and I worked 20 hours per a week for the uh, graduate school in the library and for my professors. So I got 900 U.S. dollar per month as my, my stipend. And uh, so I pay $400 for my housing and 500 for everything else. So that is 18 years ago. Then something changed. China become rich, and uh, so there was a China mir economic miracle, and uh, so the, uh, more and more Chinese family uh, be, were able to afford the tuition. So then you see the, the graduate students in, uh, Chinese graduate students in the United States, they are uh, uh, gradually, slowly increasing, but the undergraduate students in the United States dramatically, you know, uh, increasing. So when I was a graduate student 18 years ago, there was very few Chinese undergraduate students because there was very little financial assistance to undergraduate students, but then now, the vast majority of Chinese students in the United States are undergraduate students paying full time, full tuition, full tuition. Why, to why the do they come? Government. Why do they come, uh, Sean Wang? Why do they? Why do they come to the U.S.? I mean, obviously, it's a lot of people who uh, mm -hmm. apply and who make it. There's a lot of people who are here. Uh, they do well. Mm -hmm. um, do they come mm -hmm. because they want the education per se? Do they come because they want a green card ultimately you know, through you know immigration process? Do they come because they want to be citizens of the world? Do they come because they want to go back to China and use their you know education, their skills back in the Chinese economy? Uh, can you give us a handle on which of those things is most important um, to the average Chinese student who is here? All of them. Jay, you are very uh, knowledgeable. You know that what Chinese uh, students want. And uh, let me quickly finish my previous point. And the high school students are also increasing. And Chinese high school students and college uh, uh, undergraduate students in the United States uh, uh, dramatically increased uh, for the past decade. And uh, when I was a graduate student here, Chinese high school visiting student was unheard of. And nobody, no family would send their kids high school kids to the United States to study. But now it's very, very, very popular. And uh, so just give one example. Uh, in Beijing and Shanghai and uh, uh, Canton, all these what we call first line cities in China, the metropolitan, all these big cities. And uh, we, when it's time to take college entrance examination to be admitted into a college or university in China, in these big cities, you see fewer and fewer Chinese local students from Beijing or Shanghai, all these big metropolitan cities, to take that exam to be admitted into a Chinese college, because they are or they are either going to study overseas 
already already studied overseas as a high school kid. Mm. So now back to your question, why they want to come to the United States? Oh, as I said, all of them. Number one, U.S. educational system is fantastic. You know, no matter how many problems we have, and but uh, overall, our educational system is fantastic. It's expensive. It's not uh, uh, really. Somebody may argue not really worth it. But uh, for uh, for a uh, middle class Chinese family, and uh, not uh, the tuition is not the issue. And if you are a resident of Beijing or Shanghai, you own two apartments, and the one apartment you you uh, you live uh, uh, with your family, the other apartment you can rent it out or sell it, and uh, easily worth one million U.S. dollar. An apartment in Beijing or Shanghai, all the big cities. And so the, 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 the you know, the, the cost for travel and uh, tuition, you know, you just, you, you mentioned before the show, you just watch crazy rich Asians. There are a lot of crazy rich Chinese in Beijing and Shanghai as well. <laughs> so, uh, I knew that. So for, the, <laughs> yeah, so, the, so for the middle class family, they, they prefer the student, their kids have a better education and uh, preferably overseas. Why? They, they, they know this, you know, they are not against the globalization, and they, uh, they acknowledge the benefit of globalization. So for this time, for the kids in, in the Beijing, Shanghai, or Tokyo, or Seoul, or Hong Kong, it's very, very, you know, normal for a, a kid uh, study high school in one country, a college in another country, send a job in the third country, and then, uh, so that is, uh, and, and retire in the fourth country. So that is nothing, uh, you know, unusual about this, you know, uh, globalization. Uh. And uh, secondly, and uh, uh, we have to admit that we have to, because China is still under the one-party rule, and uh, the political environment is ever-changing, and it currently is quite stable, but uh, uh, Chinese people, you know, just think about it. Except my generation, every generation of Chinese, my grand, my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, my grandparents, their parents' generation, and then my grand grandparents' generation, all of them had war, famine, huge disaster, a catastrophe in their lifetime. So Chinese people are very always have this. Uh, a man side, they want to prepare for the worst. So how to prepare for the worst? Diversify your portfolio. If you are rich, you won't have a property in Hawaii, have another property in Australia, <laughs> and send your kids to work in Hong Kong. And just in case something happened to you, or to your country, or to your family. So that is uh, it's like a um, Backup plan, if you may. Uh -huh. And thirdly, so uh, ideally, the student, the kids can receive education, and then get uh, get a job offer, and get a green card or some legal permanent residency outside China. So it's good for their future, for the kids' future, and also extremely uh, uh, beneficial to the family's uh, collective future. Yeah. <clears throat> it's all money in the bank. Uh, let, let's take a short break, Chang Wang, because I want to come back and ask you about how things have changed in the government, in China, and in the U.S., so as to affect these students and their possibilities, so as to affect your practice, mm -hmm. too. Uh, so we'll be right back with Chang Wang right after this short break. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii. Broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Hey, Aloha. Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. 
but we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man, and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Okay, we're back on Think Tech Asia with uh, Chang Wang. He's an immigration lawyer practicing in St. Paul, Minnesota. Among other things, he does immigration law there. And um, we want to talk to him about how things are changing vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, government, the government regulations on immigration, both from the United States side and the Trump administration and from the Xi Jinping side. Uh, in China, mm -hmm. so uh, let's let's cover let's cover Trump first, okay? How has that okay. changed your practice? How has it changed the prospects of a Chinese student or any Chinese uh, immigrant trying to come to the United States right now? Well, the the Trump administration have a very strong anti-immigration rhetoric. So uh, it's not only against illegal immigrants but also against legal immigrants. So in the news, and we heard that some legislators and uh, proposed uh, anti-legal immigration bill. That, was, that didn't go through last year, but uh, Stephen Miller, that 30-something guy in the White House uh, 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 responsible for the travel ban, now is dropping another you know, regulation and uh, only in the executive branch to, uh, against legal immigrants. And uh, we will see that that will uh, uh, take effect. But, you know, the, the, the answer is multi-layered. You know, it's simply because my own party is, is dealing with mostly, or primarily uh, dealing with uh, 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 employment-based immigration. And uh, 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 so that is the anti uh, legal immigrant uh, executive orders and the regulations will not directly affect me immediately. But uh, here is uh, what it meant, this anti-legal immigrant, you know, policy. The number one is will close down, will significantly restrict the number of legal, legal immigrants in the United States. And our current legal immigration system was originated in 1965, Immigration and the Naturalization Act. That is what we call family-based immigration. Yes. And the primary goal is family unification, which means if you get a green card or citizenship and your immediate family, your, your uh, kids and your uh, parents and your spouse are eligible and, uh, uh, to come to the United States and uh, uh, live here legally. And, and even your other relatives, they need to wait a long time, like your brothers and sisters, but they are still eligible. This is, there is a very uh, derogatory uh, a word for this family unification. It's called the chain immigration. Yeah. And uh, the old immigration lawyer will tell you this is very, uh, uh, this is wrong. This is to use this word to describe family unification is derogatory and it's unfair. If Trump administration got the, what they want, cut, they will restrict, you know, they either by visa denial or by uh, request for further evidence or they for uh, many different mechanisms they can play to significantly restrict legal immigration and uh, based on this family unification system. And uh, we'll put, uh, if we do not change current immigration law, we'll put more and more uh, pressure on the employment-based immigration. So if we cannot get, if people cannot get to the United States legally under family unification, they have to think other ways. They have to uh, uh, try to find a job and try to study and uh, to uh, uh, study in the United States. Or, or, or visit the United States. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, all, the, all the uh, uh, all different channels for uh, legal immigrants will be, will, see, uh, will be under pressure, and you'll see that uh, more and more backlog. And uh, I just check on the State uh, Department of Visa Bulletin. 
see that for a Chinese uh, uh, skilled worker, for example, if you already have a job in the United States and your, uh, your company filed a, a green card petition on your behalf, and uh, you have a master's degree from a prestigious American university, you still need to wait at least three and a half years just to submit your file to the State Department. So is this and a, is this a so conscious this slowdown, Chang Wang? Is this a slowdown by the Trump administration? In other words, the law would entitle you to a, a certain status, maybe a green card, uh, and, but, but the government, the uh, Immigration Service, will slow down because of the Trump administration's uh, you know, resistance to immigration? Am, am I right about uh, that? I, I, you're right, but it's a little bit uh, uh, complex. You know, let me explain. First of all, the slowdown, the backlog, started many years ago and uh, 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 way before Trump administration. Our immigration system has many, many problems, and the, the one of them is a very, very long uh, waiting time for all, can, all kinds of categories, family-based immigration, employment-based immigration. So it's basically virtually impossible and uh, for many you know, foreign workers to, uh, uh, to wait that long. And, and, but they have to, because Otherwise, you lose your status, you become illegal, stay, they have, they, you have to leave. So everybody has to, to, uh, uh, to wait. So what about and my choices? Company, uh, I come to you and I'm, I'm uh, a Chinese client of yours, <clears throat> and I say, look, this sounds too hard for me. I want to wait that long. I only you know, have so mm -hmm. many years to live. Um, what, what is your suggestion? What is my next, uh, my next alternative? Should I go to the UK? Uh, should I go to Canada? Should I go to France? What do I do? Well, it, it depends. Uh, the, 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 you know, the a typical lawyer's response to every question it, it depends. <laughs> First of all, if you, want to stay in, if you want to stay in the United States, let's look at your, uh, uh, you know, your portfolio. Let's look at, uh, do you have a master degree from a graduate school in, in, in Chicago? In the United States, or you have, uh, do you have a PhD, you know, from NYU, or uh, 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 you, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge you have, and what kind of, you know, background you have, and we we, we look at that, and we design a, a path, and uh, so there are uh, employment-based immigration category one that is reserved for, uh, as I said. Extraordinary ability person, uh, outstanding professor and researchers, and a multinational uh, executive. So that is only reserved for a very, very small number of person. Most people don't qualify. And then, uh, if you already have a job offer and from a U.S. company, and U.S. company will most likely to file immigration petition for you under employment-based immigration category two, that is for master degree or PhD holders, and then you need to wait. And, let me, let me uh, go to the last you, point. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, Chang Wang, and I, wanna, mm -hmm. I do want to cover this last point, and that is uh, how have things changed under Xi Jinping? I mean, he's under pressure now with uh, Trump's tariffs. Things are not as friendly mm -hmm. as they used to be between the United States and China, regrettably. Um, the, the average Chinese citizen may not have the same uh, gemutlichkeit about uh, life in the United States. And I'm, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering if, uh, if, if, I can get, if I can get papers, when I get good, good and fed up with life in the U.S., can I get papers to be an immigrant uh, uh, permanent resident in China? Is that easier now, or is it, is it harder? Uh, well, it's... It it's easier. But the number one, China is open. You know, uh, I'll tell you that uh, 18 years ago, when I need to get a, a passport, I need to wait it a very long time to get my passport. And my parents' generation in the 1980s, they needed to wait six months to get the passport. Now it's five to seven days you get your passport and uh, for Chinese citizens. So it's very quick and a very efficient system. And secondly, uh, they did, and there was virtually no restriction for any Chinese to study abroad. And uh, you, 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 you can go to anywhere you want and to study. And the number, uh, on, uh, on the other side, it's very easy for foreigners to travel to China right now, either uh, as a tourist 
or as a visitor, or business people, or as a foreign export. If you want to work in China, the Chinese government normally encourages that. And, uh, you know, a lot of college kids go to China to teach English. And uh, uh, more senior people like you, they go to China to, to advise and account, uh, advise the, uh, uh, you know, uh, forms and the companies and the universities and to teach at the college level. So it, it's very easy for foreigners to go to China, but you know, the pollution is a problem. <laughs> The pollution, the food safety, and the drug safety, and the water quality, yeah, well, we'll, everything is problem. If you pull the wings out of the EPA, we may have the same, same issues in the United States soon enough. But uh, my last question is, uh, so are you saying that Xi Jinping and all the stress going on over the tariffs has not uh, limited my prospects about going to China, uh, staying in China, getting a visa to, to, to live and do business in China? It has not affected no. them? No, uh, I, I can honestly tell you that uh, foreigners are welcome in China. I'm not trying to do a promotion for Chinese government. I, I don't like that. And uh, but uh, uh, my own experience is, you know, uh, China is pretty foreigner village, uh, foreigner friendly place right now. And of course, you need to be mindful. Number one, you are watched. You are cl closely watched. And because you are totally transparent, either a Chinese or a foreigner in China, because your cell phone might be bugged, your laptop might be hacked, and your uh, uh, all your bank transfer and all your all your communication are, are watched and monitored. Uh -huh. And uh, so, as long as you don't criticize the president, president and the current administration, you are okay. They allow you uh, a certain, you know, uh, you know, flexibility. But as long as you you touch the sensitive issues, what we say what we, we, we say that you know you criticize the political system, you argue for the minority welfare and and so on, you may be viewed as a personata non grata, and, and then you you got yourself into trouble. Yeah. So uh, you know it's a Chinese different. It's a, what I uh, like to call is a parallel universe. It's, uh, China and the United States are completely two different universes. Well, so, not so, on the same planet. Some people think that China is the leading universe these days. Uh, to wit, there was well, a, an article in the New York Times, or was it the MIT uh, newsletter today, that suggested that China had a new way of looking um, at the, the will of the people. And uh, in the past, well, it was voting, and now it's, it's more like demographics and data where they get their feedback from the people and act in that regard. Well, we're, we're out of time, but I would like to, I would sure. like to continue this conversation on a number of drill-down points, if you don't mind, and I'll contact you, uh, Wang Chang, and, and uh, let's do another show about some of the elements of this one. Thank you so much That's for good. participating. Aloha, Thank Sai you, Jin, Xie uh, Xie. <laughs> All right, Xie Xie, take care. Uh, yes.